Welcome to this segment of Kids Ask. My guest today is Julian Sugasagoitia, an international scholar, museum director, and consultant. Julian Sugasagoitia is the former director of El Museo del Barrio in New York and has been the CEO and director of the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art in Kansas City since 2010. Welcome, Mr. Sugasagoitia. Welcome, Julian. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for agreeing to answer the children's questions. The children asking the questions are from the Vendée region in France. They are students of the Collège Puis Chabon, Au Poiré Sur Vie, and were helped by their wonderful, dedicated arts teacher, Celia Mounier. The selected questions come from the students Julien Hollomme, Noah Forestier, Lucas Cyr, Angouran Noblé, Owen Lampère, and Ian Fayet. So let's dive right in. Here are the first three questions. Who is your favorite artist? What is your favorite piece of art? What is your most famous piece of art in the museum? Wow, that, 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 is, that, is, that is a very difficult uh, question. But, but before I, 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 I go into the answers, let me tell you that I'm so happy to be talking to you in Vendée. I've been following the Vendée Globe. I have a total fascination for that race. It has put some of the greatest sailors around the world. And I know it just finished. Uh, so when we're recording this, some of the uh, les vainqueurs sont arrivés au Sable de Lonne. And I cannot tell you how, how wonderful it is to see that every four years. So anyway, may, maybe some of you are sailors, uh, but just know that I love your region and uh, it has been very present recently. Now, talking about what is my favorite works of art, you know, there's two ways of answering this. The museum is an encyclopedic museum. By encyclopedic museum, we mean a museum that has or tries or attempts to do in the best of, of the encyclopedia movement, l'encyclopédie, uh, to represent the different parts of the world. So in, in, in a city like Kansas City, having works of art from China, from the Native Americans, from uh, Europe, it gives people here a way of accessing world cultures that would not be otherwise possible for if we couldn't travel. And right now, because of COVID, of course, no one is traveling. So what a better way of illustrating that a museum is a place to see and discover the world. Now, my personal favorite, so I, I'm, I did my studies in France, actually, at l'Ecole du Louvre. And so in a way, I'm very, very uh, informed uh, by, by, by some French artists. And in particular, I love Monet and Les Affaires de l'Orangerie. And we have at the museum, and I wrote part of my PhD dissertation on Les Affaires de l'Orangerie and Rodin, so things that inform me early on. And so we have a beautiful, uh, very large canvas, part of a triptych by uh, Monet, that could be one of the pieces that I, I have a lot of fun for. And right now, as we speak, we are uh, providing a very special experience that makes that piece uh, with a special lighting, look as if Monet was in the Nanfer garden that he created in Giverny. And you see the lighting from dusk to dawn. So that is going to be an interesting thing. And you can see it on our website. L'Orangerie avec les Nanfer à Paris is in a way an attempt. And it is like the perfection of Monet's vision. So all his work and all his life working towards that goal. So it just elements of that but yeah very very fond of those spaces so so you would would you say that your favorite artist is monet or you wouldn't you wouldn't limit yourself to that i would say that that no i wouldn't limit now but 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 it's right now one that i'm thinking of because we're staging that wonderful piece that we have in the museum in in in, in wonderful light so we're doing a lot of things with that but no a collection like the nelson has taught me to love Native American art in a way that had not uh, really focused on it before. Um, we have a sculpture park in which recently we commissioned Andy Goldsworthy, a British artist, to do uh, a wonderful piece that, that is called Walking Wall. So that is also a favorite of mine right now. In the sculpture park, we have also Henry Moores. Uh, but there's so many works of art, you know, naming one, it's always making a disservice to all the others. 
we have one of the greatest Chinese and, and Southeast Asian collections in America, uh, wonderful pieces. And also it opens your mind to, 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 to those, that art, that creativity. So it's just always very inspiring. But yeah, if I had to say one that right now that, but it changes. I mean, we could be walking the museum and, and, and all of something would cut my attention and become the favorite of the day. You would keep discovering your favorite pieces. Yeah, just to go to a museum and say, what is going to be today my favorite? You know, and maybe things change. So yeah, very, very fluid. A visit to a museum should be something always of a discovery, but also never to feel intimidated that you need to know more than what you already know, or just your feelings, what they tell you, what you like and what you don't like. Mm. So let's, let's go on to two COVID-related questions. Is COVID-19 a source a source of inspiration for artists. Pensez-vous que la crise sanitaire due au Covid a un impact sur votre musée? So, Covid-19 has it been a source of inspiration for artists and how do you think the pandemic has affected the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art? So, the pandemic definitely affected the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. Uh, we were closed for at least six months from March to September. Uh, because of COVID, then we put all the measures in place to open safely. And now today we're seeing a visitation that is lower than it used to be, but people derive a lot of pleasure of being in the museum. So in a way, uh, the mission is still alive and, and well, but it definitely has affected economically. It has affected also staff. It, it, is, it is a very difficult uh, pandemic that has affected everyone and everywhere. So it does have, and it will continue to carry some effects. We have to reduce our budget. So we're doing different things, different kind of exhibitions just to accommodate a smaller budget and, and still deliver great art. In terms of the creativity that can ensue because of COVID, I think if you think about a hundred years ago, the roaring twenties, uh, les années folles des années 20, uh, that followed the first world war and also followed the pandemic of the Spanish flu, did allow for a lot of creativity coming out of that, but also for a lot of a desire for uh, being with the arts and expressing oneself. So I think we will see a lot of that uh, and a lot of reflection about what these months of isolation mean to us, and we will see it through the arts. I'm certain of that. Do you want me also to answer one or two in French? Yeah, maybe. I mean, there's one right here uh, in French that uh, I, I find kind of, uh, uh, mm. <laughs> it took me a little while to actually understand what they were asking. Um, they say, vous préférez l'art ou le l'art? So okay. the students are being a little, <laughs> a little cheeky, uh -huh. I would say. <laughs> so maybe that one you could answer in French as well. Vous préférez l'art ou le l'art? Parfait. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bon, ben, l'art me donne de la, de, une inspiration, et c'est une nourriture spirituelle et émotionnelle, mais le lard, évidemment, est reconfortant et j'adore justement manger un bon cassoulet et un bon cassoulet a toujours beaucoup de lard. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> would you, um, I can translate, would you mind telling the, the listeners who don't speak French what, what you just said as well in English? It's, it's a perfect answer. Okay. <laughs> It's a cheeky question. So, <laughs> it was a great question and of course a, a play of words with l'art and l'art. Uh, so uh, what I said is that uh, art for me is a spiritual nourishment while l'art, which is like the bacon, uh, becomes a very nourishing one. And with the cold that we're experiencing right now, uh, I know that a bon cassoulet has a lot of lard, and, and that is very fulfilling. So I'm, I'm, I'm dreaming of a cassoulet right now. <laughs> so the second part of this uh, question is... Do you prefer the contemporary art or a classical art? I'm, I'm very lucky to work at the Nelson Atkins that we have a mission and a mandate to, to cover not only uh, all the geographies, that is as, aspiration, there's always geographies that you might not have represented, and also all times of human history and also the contemporary times. So we're not limited neither by geography nor time. Uh, so museums, as you know, have a very defined uh, uh, time or uh, museums like in France uh, or in Paris in particular have defined times. The Louvre goes up to a certain time, then it passes on to uh, 
the 19th century, for instance, is the Musée du d'Orsay. Uh, but then also you have one dedicated just to Asian art. You know, so the different different ways. But we are both big and, and intimate at the same time, and we can have all the periods. But my personal liking definitely for contemporary art has evolved over time. So I, I was trained more first in classical and historical art, uh, all the way from Egyptian art to, 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 to Renaissance and, and, and classic art. And then 19th century to the 20th century, the modernism era is my particular field of more research. But contemporary art and having worked with a lot of living artists myself makes it very um, engaging and also a, a great form of expression, but also tells you about the times we're living. So artists are always, always translating uh, the times we're living in a very special way. So I'm, I'm, I'm really always motivated by, by, by trying to understand, follow and, 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 and look at what galleries uh, do and, and what galleries represent a lot of living artists. And so that, that you get a sense of, of, of what they're thinking, how the art is representing our times. And what I like most about a museum like the Nelson Atkins is that it allows you to put also contemporary artists in dialogue with works of art from the past. And the past informs our present, of course, but also the, the present allows us to understand works of the past in a different light. So we have a few uh, personal questions as well. What studies have you done? What do you do in your free time? Are you an artist? Lancez nous un défi, s'il vous plaît. Can you give, a, give us one artistic challenge? So I was lucky. So I was born in Mexico, but I was uh, in, in, in the French system. And so I was lucky to end up my, my mon baccalauréat à Paris. Uh, and then I stayed to do l'école du Louvre and at La Sorbonne, I did a degree in philosophy. So I, I'm a, I have a doctor en philosophie de La Sorbonne and uh, l'école du Louvre pour art history. Donc, those two careers uh, taken side by side allow me to do what I'm doing and pursuing today. Um, but I define myself, so I grew up with a mom. My mother is a professional actress and, 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 and a well-known screen and, 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 and theater personality in my country. And my sister is a professional ballerina dancer trained uh, in the Vaganova school in, uh, of the most classic rigorous. She's also a choreographer today. She just finished actually choreographing the Bolero of Ravel, a beautiful piece that she did even during COVID and outdoors. So she choreographed it so that the dancers could be outdoors. So as you see, I, I come from a family where, 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 where I see uh, the devotion, the dedication of being an artist. And I myself, I will confess, while I love the arts, I'm a servant to the artist and to the arts. So I do not practice. I don't think I have any talent as an artist myself, but I do have the uh, admiration and the recognition of other artists. So I, I want to use what I do that is both intellectual and also uh, managerial to showcase artists and art for everyone to enjoy. So that's, that's, that's if you say, what, what I like is trying to demystify the art so that people can enjoy it on their own terms. For me, that's the most important thing. Do you ever just kind of paint or, or try to create something yourself? Yes, and I think I stopped at age six or seven, and, <laughs> and I still have some souvenirs of early prints and things that I did, but I do recognize great art uh, requires a total devotion, and so I know how to enjoy the art and, and, and know the limitations that I have, and so I, I'm more of a aficionado of all forms of art you know it's the same thing with music so i know i, I well as a kid also I, I i learned a bit an instrument or two but but no and i i enjoy much more and derive a lot of pleasure of reading listening to music going to a concert and 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 supporting talented artists uh, in any way i can and finally two questions specifically about the nelson atkins museum of art in kansas city how many pieces of art do you have in your museum how much do you estimate the total tally of your pieces of, of art? You know, so while all museums, different sizes of museums have different number of works, and, and actually sometimes even we count differently because this, uh, right now, think of it, there is one display of Egyptian art where we have 
like almost 300 ushaptis. Ushaptis are the little figures that represent the deities, uh, that represent the dead and help them in the afterworld. So some, some museums would say, well, the 300 is one piece, while I think uh, other museums would say each piece is individual because each one has to be conserved and cared differently or studied. But um, so we have, our number is around 40,000 works of art, which sounds a lot and it's not a lot at the same time. It's, 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 it's interesting. What I would say is also that most museums only have on display at any given time, a fraction of their collection, not everything is on view. And why? Because for instance, we have in those 40,000 that I mentioned, maybe 10,000 are photographs and photographs, as you know, are very light sensitive and fragile to be exposed on light. So we rotate them. The, the notion of, of rotating is that we'll put ex small exhibitions of photography with a theme or with an idea or with a, with, with, with a special, uh, or representing an artist. And those will be for three or four months. And then those photographs that had been exposed to light and seen by the public, then would go to sleep for a little while. And that sometimes the ratio that we do is for three or four months of exposure, sometimes it's two or three years of, of being in the dark so that they continue to live for the longest. Not that they would recover from the light exposure, but so that we make them uh, last very long. So that's, that's the reason why not every museum has everything on view. Also, it would be unmanly you know, to have so much. But I would say 70% of, of our masterpieces, whether it's Buddhist sculpture that is not light sensitive, whether it's the Caravaggio, for instance, or European art, or in the American wind, the Benton paintings, paintings that are on, on oil on canvas are very uh, stable. Therefore, most of our work, 70% of mass works, we're always beyond view. And then other things are on rotation, which makes that when you come to the museum, you always see new things. There's always that, that kind of evolution. The museum is always changing some, some displays so that you can always have new exhibitions, new reasons to come, and also new things to discover and learn. Um, and in terms of the value of the, of the, of the, of the museum, when, when it's interesting. In, 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 in France, for instance, any work that enters into a museum becomes an, a treasure forever. Inalienable is the word in French, no? The, the France public museums will not sell it. Uh, in America, it's a bit different, the system, but nevertheless, when we acquire a work of art, it comes to the museum with the intention that we'll never separate from it because that's the reason we bought it. So I would say, while all the works have a value, an evaluation, because when we lend it or we send it, it has to have an insurance value and, and, and a replacement value, we don't monetize the collection. We don't say how much it's worth because since you're always gonna keep it forever, you're not thinking of what the value is. So we call them priceless and, and priceless because that's the reason we, we have works of art in the museum that are priceless. They have a market value when they're not in the museum, but once they become part of the museum, it's a treasure to be shared with everyone as long as the museum lives and as long, and I, I hope it's always for many, many, many generations. So that's why we don't wanna put a value on the, on the collection or on the works of art uh, when we talk about them. Just because also that's that, that, that uh, if we buy them, if we make it come to the museum is because we think they're deemed worth of generations to come. And the temptation otherwise could be just to monetize the collection, which is something we wanna avoid. I would add one question myself. I had the opportunity to interview you last mm -hmm. year. It was wonderful. Thank you again for, for taking the time that time as well. One of the things that we talked about was how the Nelson Atkins is really a community uh, museum. It serves the entire Kansas City community, but at the same time, it attracts international guests from, from everywhere. So now if you were to take yep. these, these, uh, these kids or these students, I might call them, from the Vendée by the hand, mm -hmm and they were uh, mm -hmm. at the Nelson, what would you, and perhaps you can do that in French as well, um, what would you say to them? How would you, uh, I, I just see, I, I love the Nelson by the way, so I just see sort of uh, the Nelson in front of me, I see this group of students mm -hmm. walking in and you welcome them. What, what, how would you even start their visit or what would you say to them? You know, you know what I would say, what I would like to say, and, and again, this could be almost an experiment, but let's imagine that I arrive at 10 a.m. when we open the doors and I would say to them, hey, 
you're fresh, it's early morning. First of all, a museum, you should not spend more than an hour in, in, in anything because then your attention loses, you know, even 45 minutes is good. You know, I would say there's two ways to go through a museum if it's your first time. Either you already know what you really like and you want to check it out, you know? So for instance, someone says, I'm passionate about this period of art or I really like uh, um, contemporary art or, or really want to see what Chinese art is all about. So either you select a, a room or, or a series of rooms and you see it, or if you say, hey, I like seeing museums for the first time in a very light and casual way, very quickly roam through everything and see what, 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 what catches my attention. So I would say to them, we use either strategy, either if you know very well, if you're already passionate about certain things, go spend more time in one or two galleries. If you just wanna see it, everything, en courant presque, you know, just, just quickly and, and, and see what talks to you and then maybe you stop. And then I would say, hey, let's meet in an hour or two, let's grab a coffee uh, or a sandwich. And I would like to hear what they saw and what, what experiences, what caught their attention. And also, um, you know, if, if, if there were different things for different people, I would like to say, well, why don't you take your friend to see what you like and your friend takes you to see what they liked and then share why, why that is meaningful to you. Because what I think also is that being in front of, of works of art, while we learn about the artist or the art, it's actually more interesting to me what it reveals about our oneself. Why one likes more this than that tells you more about what your personal liking or what, what, what state of emotions you are at that moment, you know? And, and that's why I say also emotions and, and, and things that you like change according to seasons, days, how you're feeling that day, what you're thinking of or what you're preoccupied. And, and definitely today, you know, uh, with COVID, with all of these things, I think we would be reflecting on things differently than if it was uh, before this pandemic. And that's also when someone says, uh, oh, I know that museum. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's quite frustrating because you can't know a museum. You can rediscover a museum time and time and time and time again, so. Exactly, exactly. And that's why I was saying, since we have so many things that need to always be changing because they're light sensitive, chances are it's not the same museum, but more importantly, you're not the same person either. You know, it's like a book. Um, and I know that once when we're right now in, in, in at the lycée, it's, it's not that you have time to reread books, but when, 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 when you're our age, um, <laughs> there are books that you remember and then you think, huh, let's read it again. And it brings you the memory of when you read it the first time, Sometimes if you read it in school, not that great memories, but sometimes when you read it by your own, incredible memories. But, but then you say, who? Oh. Or even if you read it in school, but you had it to, as an assignment, uh, comme des devoirs. Les devoirs, c'est jamais ce qu'on veut le faire le plus. But then you rediscovered many years later, and it's like, wow, this was a great book. And I, and I, and I remember that teacher saying this or that. I don't know. It's, it's that a museum is like that. It, it, it tells you about your own time, the sense of timing and, and who you are. Thank you so much. Any last words for the, for the kids? Well, enjoy, enjoy, uh, again, uh, arts in your own terms. And also, you know, I said that I, because I'm mean, influenced by so many talented people around, but it's, you can always also be creative and creativity through the arts, but also one of the things that I've learned is creativity exists in every field. And while the arts help sometimes see things differently, um, even, even, even the economy, I mean, the thinking around great economists or, or a scientist solving a problem or the, 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 the medical profession trying to get the vaccine, there is creativity in so many fields and, and all that, fresh perspectives are always to be celebrated. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much um, and thank you. Well, be safe, be safe and thank you for having me. And uh, I wish everyone could travel soon and I would always welcome anyone who comes to Kansas City. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Julian. And thank you all for listening. For my in-depth interview with Julian Sugasagoitia, please listen to episode nine at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art with director CEO Julian Sugasagoitia. Thank you for listening. Bye for now.